Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Podcast, where we help you unlock your potential freedom through land investing, real estate investing, and entrepreneurship. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investing Podcast. My name is Ron Eckie, your host for this episode. I'm really excited to have our, our CPA on for this episode, Ashish Acharya. Um, he's done great work for us for years, and he's really helped us save money on taxes, which is why a lot of you guys are listening, and also planning for taxes. So uh, a lot of good questions that we got for the community for this call, Ashish in general, and I'm really excited. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me again, Ron. Yeah, happy to have you on here. So let's just dive right into it. Most of our listeners, as you know, are land investors. They're land flippers. So let's just get started on the basics. Like, how does the IRS look at this business model? We're buying land. We are flipping it on the market right away. Mm -hmm. How does the IRS view this business model? Absolutely. So whenever people ask me that question, you know, they, they ask me through uh, the tax perspective, right? Because no one cares who, who thinks what kind of business is this. And when people start a business, they are more... Uh, worried about how much taxes I'm going to pay. So from IRS perspective, how is this different than a restaurant or, you know, flipping a house or buying a rental property, all those things. And that's where the questions comes from. And they'll tell me, how am I going to tax? Why not capital gain? All of those things. That's what you're asking. So very simply, flip, flipping a land or a house is exactly the same as Walmart buying a milk and selling it to the customer. They're flipping a milk. They buy a, uh, milk from their suppliers at a certain amount, and then they just go and sell it uh, to a, you know end customer. So they flip a milk. That's exactly what happens with you guys. You buy a land, you hold it. It doesn't matter how long you hold it. It's still a flip. That's the other thing. And how it is taxed, so just to answer, just to add to that, if you were to buy an investment property as a business model, hold on to it and then sell it, that would be capital gain, like long-term capital gain, favorable tax rate. However, flipping, which you were talking about, you pay ordinary income tax and self-employment tax. Doesn't matter if even if you are in a model of flipping a property and even if you hold a land for more than a year, you still have to pay ordinary income tax and self-employment tax. So from IRS perspective, what you're doing is flipping something and it's always taxed at a higher tax rate than compared to long-term hold investment property like rentals or stocks you know uh, it's not it's a, it's a business it's not an investment if that makes sense 100 percent. so essentially what we're buying yeah. is inventory we are buying inventory mm -hmm. this inventory is not a write-off um yeah. this is inventory that we're going to go and flip and then we get taxed when we sell it on the back end based on that profit exactly. is that basically in short that's what it is Absolutely. Since we're in the same topic, Ron, I want to say one tax saving strategy yep. uh, because it's going to, it's going to, uh, what people could do as you know, I know you guys are so successful and your, your uh, students are also very, you know, they're making good money. I, I, and some of them talk to me and, um, if you're going to do more of these and you also now think, okay, you know what, I'm going to start investing and build a long-term wealth. I'm just going to buy a land and keep it with me. And it's very, it's, you should really try to separate two activities, meaning you buy some land and you intend to not to flip it. But if you buy under the same you know, uh, LLC or entity you have where you flip, you know, when you sell it, even though it was your investment property, you still pay ordinary income tax. It's very hard to fight that it was my investment property. Yep. So at that point, what we suggest is put in your name or you know, in, in your trust or other entity where you have nothing to do with this uh, flipping business. So that you can get capital gain treatment when you sell it. That makes hundred percent sense. Yeah, yep. and also, also this. And I'm sorry to cut you off. If you know that some land you're gonna hold it for more than a year, and you still had an intention to flip it, but you just have a document, you never had the intention, right? So it sometimes a lot of developers and people would like to buy land and then develop and sell it. So it's always better to again talk to your CPA, see where you stand from tax obligations. But it's it's always better to separate them long-term hold asset even if you intend to flip to document that your your intention was different mm -hmm. wow that, that's okay. that makes a lot of sense and that's one thing i quote a ton of and that's something that's always stuck with me from what you've told me just all the conversations mm -hmm. we've had and it was probably one of the first times we spoke you're like do not put uh long-term investments in the same llc as 
uh, you're flipping. And that's ex essentially what you're saying. So when you have a long-term investment LLC and that's all long-term investments, whether it's rental, whether it's land long-term, you will get tax capital gains. But if you start mixing those in with your flipping activities, the IRS isn't going to like that. And you're going to get taxed. Um, even if it's a long-term hold, you're going to get taxed based on income. Is that correct? Exactly. So I kind of going off on a tangent. I didn't have this, uh, written down, but just what you're saying is interesting because we are starting to push bigger deals. We're starting to push projects on our students because that's where like, that's where the big money is. So subdividing is a really big thing right now. So what, what's kind of your suggestion for that? Like, let's say we buy 50 acres, we cut it up into five, 10 acre parcels. Maybe we sell one of them after six months, five months, but the other four parcels take another six to eight months and then we're over a year. I know that's kind of a loaded question there, but if there's yeah. like, would you just hold it for a year maybe? And then just like, cause that's a big tax difference. It's 20% for a year. Is it not capital gains? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 15. Most, if you make you know, around $500,000 and less, you only pay 15% plus some Obamacare tax, you know, if you're above 250. But what you're asking is, it's a legit concern. And once you have a high volume of these lands and you're selling left and right, and, but you have some land that you know could do better in, in, you know, maybe after a year and if you want to hold it, that's exactly what I was telling you. Even if you buy a big uh, chunk of you know, thing and subdivide it, I would still document your intention with your business partner, lawyer, attorney, CPAs, agents saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to save half of this for myself, for my family. I'm not going to sell it. You can always change your intention later on. Yep. If you're going to hold more than a year, I would document that intention somehow where you can prove email and set the emails or in communications and then put it on a different, uh, retitle the ownership. I mean, it's very easy, right? It, is, mm -hmm. it literally takes $100 and less to retitle the um, uh, land to your another entity and hold it there and sell everything else. That way you pay a, you know, no self-employment tax, first of all, you know, uh, and then also lower a 15% tax rate uh, yep. on the capital gain. Yep. That what we should, we, should, we should be doing. And you'll have the option, correct? Because in a flipping business, you can't 1031. Is that correct? You would have exactly. the option to That's, 1031 yeah. it if it's a long-term investment. Exactly. You cannot do 10, uh, 1031st on ordinary income kind of deal, which is basically what this is. I've learned so, a few things from you over the years, Ashish. So I'm, I'm starting to quote like the things you say. I'm, I'm happy that I'm learning. But um, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions from members. Like I said, I, I let everyone sure. know that I have and you're on. A lot of people are really excited. So let's just start kind of with basics. Like what should they file as? Um, like if this is their first year, 2023 mm -hmm. flipping land, how should mm -hmm. they file their taxes? Obviously, I always suggest getting a CPA and always push people to mm -hmm. professionals um, speaking with them. But what is like the case by case? Obviously, you have either filing as uh, yourself, essentially filing as a sole member LLC, filing as an S corp. What are your suggestions, or what are the guidelines behind those? Yeah, that's. I think this would be a most important decision for flipper once when they start, because most of the time, if let's say you are rental investors and you do, then you don't really the LLC does not really save you any taxes. So you can always get one after you buy it or close it and all those things, but for any kind of flips like this one, land or a house, then your entity structuring does take, uh, it, it does save you taxes. So it, you're supposed to do it correctly to begin with. Man, I had some clients who came to me uh, and you know, did exactly what you guys do, uh, but have you know, all the rental properties in the same entities and all the investments. This guy had to pay, I think $300,000 extra tax just because he has the wrong entity in that. And he was almost crying. Uh, he came to me and we have, um, in, what I'm saying is yes, LLC is going to be very important when you begin. So this is, I think we, just to continue from our last conversation we had um, and on the last podcast, easiest way, be, let's say you don't have access to a CPA and you know, you, um, you just, you, you, you're in rush to close, then I would say single member LLC, you get a single member LLC that you 100% own by yourself or your trust owns again, but it has to be owned by one person. You can flip everything there, you start flipping there, then you can go talk to uh, your attorney or your CPA and a tax advisor and say, okay, I started doing this. Is it, is it the right time for me to be an S corporation? Though that's the biggest concern. And you you know, I mean, we do a very detailed analysis of, okay, at what point, you know, depending on your income level, should you be changing to an S corporation? We will do that. Your, your tax advisors should do that as well. 
depending on which state you want to be. Like some, some, some states, it's, it's bad to be an S-corporation, even though you know, it saves you in self-employment tax. So not a blanket advice. Obviously, talk to an uh, your CP and attorney, but yep. very simply, start with scale, uh, single member LLC. And you can always retroactively get an S-corporation for the LLC, even after the year is ended. Mm -hmm. Easiest way, single member LLC. So what's your kind of like, so let's say you're reviewing someone's taxes from 2022. Yeah. You're like, we got to file this as an S corp. You, you guys made too much money. Um, is that too late at that point? Cause for an S corp, don't you need to pay yourself a reasonable salary? Is that too late? Like if it's the next year yeah. already, or how do you do that? Exactly. So very good question. So my answer is both ways. Um, that's why we like to talk to a you know, client before year end. So actually, we can, because you can run a payroll in December, right? Let's yep. say everything is done. You come to me on December 1st and say, okay, since I made $500,000, how do I you know, save taxes? And, and after analyzing everything, let's say you save taxes through S Corp, then we can run a payroll then. It's not a big deal, right? So make sure you talk to an advisor before year closes so you can run a payroll. You can, that's the one most important thing. But even if you come to me after uh, December and you know you, you have potential to save, sometimes S corps can save you, let's say, um, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in taxes. Just the right yeah. entity, right? And if that's the case, then we will. Uh, I at, at least me, I will take a risk of filing an S corp and not even without the payroll because there are some court cases that have said, okay, in this the first year. It happens next year, catch up on your payroll. It's yep. court cases have you know, allowed that. So why lose 60 grand and not take a risk? And, that, and I, I still leave that up to the client saying, okay, this is the court case. This is what happens. Do you want to do this? And most of the time they will say yes. And, <laughs> um, and you can always go back yeah. and do it. And so that's is, is essentially filing as an S corp is the main tax saving going to be that uh, self-employment tax or is there other benefits as well mm -hmm. to running a payroll and all this? Because when you have an S corp, guys, you mm -hmm. need to run a payroll. Um, mm -hmm. You need to do all this. You will save money on self-employment because outside of the payroll, you don't need to pay self-employment. Is that correct? Exactly. Absolutely. But that's not the only uh, reason you would have an S corp. There are other things like there's something called QBI. So let's say you make $500,000. Um, you will not get any QBI if you were Schedule C because you're, you know, you're above that. There's a threshold uh, where you, know, you don't get QBI unless you have wages. If you are Schedule C, you cannot have a wage. Schedule C meaning, you know, a single member LLC without an S-Corp election cannot mm -hmm. pay wages to, your, uh, to the owners, right? So just to have that wage, if you go and uh, create, um, if you go and create uh, an S-Corp, then you can have wage to you, your spouse, right? Uh, you can um, even hire your kids if you want. But uh, you, the more the wage, the better the tax savings becomes. So it's not only the self-employment tax, but it's also the wages will qualify you for something called a QBI deduction, which is 20% of your taxable income. Uh, so is, that's also pretty significant. And you might just lose that if you, have an, you, know, if you do have, don't have an S corporation too. So again, we have to optimize how much ways uh, gives you optimal tax savings from QBI versus self-employment tax that you have to pay on the way. So again, the analysis has to be done, but to answer your question, uh, is QBI self-employment tax and paying your spouse, so this is another thing. Remember, yep. your spouse might already have a full-time job, it's already over the FICA limit, then you rather pay your spouse W-2 ways while meeting the, uh, let's say you hire her as a CFO or a COO or whatever you wanna hire her as, or him or her, and then you pay them rather than pay yourself more so that you also don't even pay self-employment FICA tax you know, even on the wages. I know mm -hmm. it gets complicated, all I'm saying is there's so many, so many ways to, you know, uh, do tax planning once you have an S corporation and depending on your situation, make sure your tax advisor is putting everything in writing and numbers so it makes sense before you pull those triggers though. For sure. That makes a ton of sense. So as you know, Ashish, um, we do, and you see from our tax returns, we do deals in pretty much every state in the country. So a big question is like, how do you do this? Um, for us, we have one LLC and then I don't even know, honestly, everything that goes on in the back end with you guys. Um, but let's say someone's doing deals in five states. Like, how does that look from a tax perspective? Are they paying state taxes for money that they made in states? Where does that look like? Let's say they're based out of Ohio, like we are, uh, their LLC, and then they're doing state uh, tax in other states. What does that look like? What should they expect from that? Yeah, that's a real concern. Uh, most when you when you start out, 
you don't really care about uh, you know state or what's going what I'm going to do go to go do the deals because you'll just go and start selling properties which is great two things needs to happen make sure you you have a good accountant and a bookkeeper who keeps track of sales per state by state so you can report the sales there there are two there are two kind of taxes right we don't deal with sales tax like excise tax that you have to pay to the state easy to do if you have been tracking all the sales and everything per state you know they will you can go online put in how much money you made in that state and you can pay sales tax that's a whole different thing some states require some states do not require each of them have their own uh, rules i'm not going to go to sales tax um, area i'm going to focus on income tax which i focus on income tax are more complicated because there's now apportionment and allocation so many things needs to happen on the back end your job as operational of the business and how you operate business is make sure you have a good record so you go and track all the sales by state we request that your your bookkeeper will give us that and when that happens we go and look at the threshold per state is it worth filing in that state uh, or are we required because some states are you know worse than other sometimes tax compliance fee might be more than you know the penalty you, you might get charged right so and then we de determine okay is this better to file in this state or not california you always file because they are bad some states <laughs> don't really care so we have to really focus and that's what we focus on on from operational though i wouldn't get too hung up saying oh i'm doing business in so many states well, i'm not sure what's going to happen i mean it's the cost of doing business do the best you can do to sell in every state doesn't really matter but uh, make sure you have a good record. Then yep. your CPA will go and allocate income to the state and you do have to file in the state. So to, from income perspective, just everyone needs to know this. You're not paying double tax though, right? Let's say you sell half in Ohio and half in, in Kentucky. Then you pay tax in Kentucky. You don't pay that tax again in Ohio. Uh, you, did, you, you, know, you, you It balances out. You just yep. have to report it correctly, but you don't pay double tax. And I want everyone to understand that. So that's something they should probably communicate pretty well to their CPAs, mm -hmm. I assume, before they, because you want to, with this business, guys, you need to make sure you have a CPA kn that knows what the heck's going on. Um, and if you get into this and then you like send them 20 properties in seven different states at the end of the year, there's some CPAs that are going to be like, I don't know what to do with all this. Um, and they don't know it from this perspective. So I would assume that's a conversation up from, from us she sh that they should have like, Listen, I'm doing, I, I flip land. I don't just do it in one state. I don't just do it in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I do it in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, mm -hmm. Miss, whatever it is. Um, that's something they should communicate up front so they can kind of, yeah. I don't know. I think you can kind of see from an accountant's face, like, okay, maybe they can't handle this. Yeah, you, so no, how normally, hopefully, if, if, they, if, if you're working with decent CPA, they will, you know, they, they're talking to you throughout the year and they're asking you what's happening. And if, as soon as they know you have in multiple state operation, then you know they will um, they will bring that up if they know what they're doing. Sometimes I'm I've seen returns for ten years even haven't been apportioned and they get a notice from state and then they will start looking for better accountant. That happens too. So hopefully this kind of videos that you guys put out is informational and helps your you know uh, students and everyone else to realize that don't wait until you get and uh, you and you get a notice because it gets more expensive to file ten years of returns and pay all these penalties. So mm. you're right, you just need to give all the information, work with someone who is more, who has time and who talks to you for, about the planning and what's going on. Just don't go for a tax, pap tax preparation service. Otherwise, they just crunch your numbers, give you tax return without asking you anything. Yep, exactly. You gotta communicate with your tax account because it's more than just, and what you provide, Ashish, is so valuable. Like it's more than just the tax returns. Like it's also tax planning, which is a huge part. Like guys, paying less money on taxes is making you more money. And some people don't realize that. Like yeah. if you are filing as an LLC or filing wrong, it, he said it could save you 50 or $60,000. That's 50 or 60,000 more in your pocket that is untaxed um, in your pocket to put into more deals, to put in long-term investments, whatever that situation is. But let's get into the kind of the tax savings part. You talked about some with the S corp. Um, what about real estate and professionals? Can you touch base on that a little bit? Like, is there value in that obvious, or you can talk about that from a, we can start basic on that and we can yeah. go from there. Um, can you talk about the real estate professional status? Maybe just start like what it is, honestly. Okay. No, this, this is good. So if you're in a land flipping business, I, so here's the thing, this is how it works. Most of the business, like rental investors, they not, they're not there to quickly flip a property and make money. Their long-term wealth, you know, they might have their full-time job. They just buy this investment property and stay with it and maybe sell this in you know, once or twice in the next five years and make some money and move on. 
But flipping business, like you know, makes a lot of money. You go, you flip to make money. It's not like, you know, you flip to lose money. Rental, <laughs> you know, yeah. And people don't understand. On the rental property side, like commercial, any kind of real estate you hold, you, you, you rarely, you know, with depreciation, will, you'll never have kind of huge income that impacts your taxes. Yep. Most of the time, if you do things right. Flipping, man, it just, you, it throws you in a whole different tax bracket. And as soon as you, like your students, right, they will have a full-time job and they, they, they look at you and they start doing this and they'll make $200,000 the first year. That $200,000 just bumps them in, you know, from 32 tax bracket to 37. And they pay a lot of taxes. Now, where does a real estate professor come into play is how do you manage your, uh, you know, your career-wise and your spouse's career maybe, and or even your own career, depending on how much money you're making and if you are ready to quit your job. So this is how it works. Why is it so important? Let me tell you why it's so important. You make $500,000 through a land flipping business, let's say. No, you have no other income. And then uh, you, you probably, if, you, in, if you're in you know, the normal t- state with taxes you 5%, let's say, then you're paying almost $120,000, $130,000, $150,000 on time in total tax. You could save entire $150,000 maybe not entirely depending on which state, but you know, at this hundred thousand dollars, completely every single year, if you could understand the value of qualifying as a real estate professional from, from IRS perspective, and then managing your own money and investing in, in, in such a certain way and you know, uh, uh, rental property and other properties so that you can offset your income without losing money. And that's the other thing that people need to understand. Any other business, restaurant, or if you open up, um, I don't know, you know, tea shop. You have to actually lose money to save taxes. You made $500,000, you need to spend $500,000 to not pay any taxes on the $500,000. However, in real estate, you make $500,000 through your land flipping business. You go use that money to build your asset. You buy another, you buy rental property. Just buying the rental property and meeting these requirements can completely offset your income without losing the money. So you're pocketing extra 150 grand tax free or maybe $100,000 tax free every single year. And that happens a lot uh, as you grow and as you have you know, more money coming in and as you're building your long-term wealth. Everyone does that. Why not do it in the right way so you're not paying $100,000 to the IRS? Absolutely, yeah. And that's called a cost segregation, bonus depreciation. You guys yeah. can look that up um, as far as like the tax savings on that guy. It's a cheat code, honestly, but it's a legal yeah. cheat code like to paying no taxes. It's a realistic thing, especially for land flippers, like you said, are putting so much time into this, right? Because yeah. that's you. There and, are requirements for being a real estate professional. Exactly. Maybe, maybe I can. I know you asked me what 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 is rep status. Let me let me let me answer very easily, uh, so you know people can understand if they qualify or not. If you're flipping land, you know if you're working uh, full time, then you already qualify as reps. If you're doing flipping land full time, then you already you already qualify as reps. Now your next step is to okay, how can I work with my tax advisor so my all my long term investment can benefit me? It's very simple, easy. If you are doing this part time, then you could also qualify. If you have a full time job, it's going to get harder and harder and you need to talk to your advisors. Okay, how can I manage my and my spouse's career so I qualify? It takes time to you know, understand it. Rules are complicated and it's a very simple rule. I'll tell this and maybe, you know, if anyone wants to know, they can Google this. This is this complicated, but information is out there. All mm-hmm. you have to understand is this. You got to work at least 750 hours in real estate. Let's say flipping, flipping land. 750 hours flipping a land a year that's the first requirement so if you do full-time you qualify that's what i was telling you earlier now if you have a full-time there's another prong of test and that says you have to work as much in real estate as any other thing you do in your you know from career personal service like job wise so if you have a full-time job then you have to now that 750 hours bumps up to 2000 hours because normally a full-time job is around 2000 hours so so all that to say is if, if you have a full-time job, you got to work 2,000 hours before you can qualify as reps. If you have no job, 750 hours, and then, then you'll qualify. But remember, for land flippers, it's very different. Just qualifying as a rep status under the land flipping business does nothing to you. Now, then you're going to have to layer in real st- uh, material participation on your rental properties and how you manage that. All of those things comes into play. So you don't need to talk to, an, uh, talk to uh, your advisor. But the good news is that if you're doing this full time, super easy. You just need to manage a few rules and your CPA and your advisor will probably help you with that. Yeah. And I think you probably see it a lot. Ashish, like 
and we probably talked about it too much or not enough guys like in terms of like this is flipping and this is income that we're getting like like she said like we can easily make five hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. in uh this but like how do we minimize taxes and how do we build long-term wealth this does both of those buying rental properties is going to minimize or erase your taxes um, it could erase your taxes for multiple years, one year. If I buy enough rental properties this year, it could erase my taxes for the next three, mm -hmm. five years. Those can roll over those uh, things, but I'm sure you see it with clients, stuff like that. Like the most wealthy long-term clients are ones who are minimizing their taxes as well as buying these appreciating assets, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, and I'm going to tell something next step because we see so many, we see who just started, we see uh, multi-millionaires, we have done this right uh, in various businesses so just you and this applies to you as well ron and this is what we're going to talk about in our planning call next is that now you have kind of have established this business in a way that it kind of runs itself you have employees you have analysts and everything now this we talk about this rep status so much right or you can if you qualify as reps you go save um a hundred thousand dollar taxes yes it happens but there's a trade-off like you have to get involved in the business think about you know Again, there's no politics in this, but any, any lawmaker, does, it does exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say Trump, right? He's a real estate investor. He came into the office. He made a 100% bonus depreciation. He's paying zero taxes because of that. Now, he's not trying to go and qualify as reps. I mean, he doesn't have time for that, but he still paid zero. Even he, without qualifying as reps, he or she or, or any, any kind of law, all the lawmakers will use real estate to save taxes. And there's one way. And that's the next step of your, for your students and if, even for your business is... Qualifying as reps converts all your rental properties to non-passive so you can offset your non-passive business income. That's normally 90% of people who get started with real estate does. But as you become more wealthier and rich and high net worth individual, then what you do is you do reverse engineering. What you do is now, I want a vacation. I, want, I don't want to work anymore. But how do I still, I have my business which my employees run, my CEO run, my analysts run. How can I now have, still have a real estate to offset the income? That's where the reverse uh, kind of engineering of the, um, this passive activity loss rule comes. Meaning, now you become passive in your own business. You spend less than, let's say, 500 hours managing your business, have everyone else manage, then it becomes passive. Now you don't have to qualify as reps. You can buy anything in the world, and not, I mean, in real estate, right, uh, in, the, in the US, and then do the same thing across segregations and bonus depreciation without qualifying as reps. You can save that. And that would be, next, that would be for you, Ron, it's going to be your next step in your business and you know how you all because you have different businesses right yep. you can at least have one business or two business become passive so you can have without even qualifying as reps you can have uh, long-term rentals and storage units and multi-family houses offset those income going uh, forward without even qualifying as reps so again it really depends what you are what you do how much money you got so many things comes into play you got to work with your tax advisor yeah i 100 percent agree and something ashish is on us constantly about like trying to get this long-term stuff. And it's hard sometimes like, cause it yeah. takes time to find good deals. It takes exactly. time to find good rental properties. I'm not throwing my money anywhere and ne yeah. neither should anyone. Like you gotta put time and mm -hmm. effort into finding those write-offs, those rental properties that are gonna be write-offs. So how, how do you suggest, we're gonna go backwards a little bit. So someone's starting out there, buy, they bought a deal for 100,000, sold it for 200,000. Um, they plan, it's earlier in the year, whatever situation is. Like, do you suggest, or what's your advice? I don't know if it's necessarily CPA advice, but what's your advice on like, setting aside taxes or what's kind of what should their mindset be when they're starting to make some money they see this money kind of piling up they don't want to put all their money into inventory because as we talked at the beginning yeah. inventory is not an expense you are going to yeah. owe taxes on everything you made money on so what's your kind of advice there in terms of setting aside some for taxes exactly you know before i go there ron i want to mention this to all of you and, um, all of your um, listeners and even you is that I was talking about this with my other um, same you know, flippers, basically both kind. It, this applies to you as well. Whenever you sell something and you make that money, I know, you know as a business operation, you're going to go and buy one of the inventory so you can sell it, right? I mean, if you find a nice deal. But before doing that, just make sure you take the money out of the business and then maybe recontribute to the business and then buy it. And here's the reason. Because let's say you make a million dollars, you take nothing out of the business, and then you put everything back in the inventory. When you go buy, go buy and go, if you're going to buy a primary residence or investment property, bank is not going to like that. Bank is going to say, yeah, you made a million dollars, but everything was used in the business. That's not your money. 
your business is a you know it's a ca it needs cash to operate so you just made the cash you, your business is using it you're not using it it's your money you have no dti and debt to income ratio goes very very down to qualify for the loans so to counteract that what we do is we have to show distribution in your you know in your, in your k1 meaning in, in your tax return so as soon as you make money go ahead and take it out and let it put it back and then buy and buy the land again okay, there's no taxable transaction it's just how to present it and most of the cpas will not understand because they don't they're not involved in real estate they don't understand dti they don't care about your lendability right but i do because and i I've, I've suffered myself most of my clients will come new clients will come to me and say oh i don't qualify for the loans and i have a million dollars in my business so you have to amend your tax return sometimes you cannot even amend your return so they lose on so many deals meaning before i go on into your side now about the inventory cash tied inventory the the first step I want every one of your students, especially when they're starting out because they can start getting, making money and they go want to in, implement a tax saving strategy with rental, they don't qualify for the loans. So for them to qualify, make sure you're taking the money out. Don't spend it. You can put it back and buy the inventory. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so business bank, you, you sell the property, you get money in your business bank, uh, distribute that to your personal bank. And then is yeah. there a time period that a lender is going to want to see that's staying in your personal bank? No, they, I don't. They <laughs> never ask you that. All, yeah. all they care is when if you do that, your bookkeeper is gonna treat that cash out as a distribution. And when the tax return is done, you're gonna have you know three hundred thousand dollars moving as a distribution. And the uh, the lender just sees the tax return. They don't care about timing, right? So that's how it works. There's no uh, holding requirement or anything. You can put it, can take it out, put it back. And honestly, what you can do is um, every single time transaction happens. Again, so easy to transfer money on nowadays like online. You don't, you don't even have to write a check. Transfer it out and put it back right away and your bookkeeper will handle the rest. If you don't have a bookkeeper, CPA will, can show it and, uh, as it is uh, if you don't have a bookkeeper. But um, you got to do so that. that. That's called a distribution going out to yourself. What's that, yeah. what's that look like on tax returns going back into the business? It's, depending on you know, how you want to structure it, it, it can be uh, additional capital you put in the business, yeah. which is non-taxable. Yeah. It's just you're putting more money. Or you can show as a loan to your own business and um, as, a, as, a, you know, as a loan from shareholder, you can do that too. It's the same. There's no tax implication whatsoever. Got it. That makes sense. So yeah, so going back on that, so what should people be setting aside? So let's say they, yeah. they made $100,000. Um, do they, they, they distribute $100,000 to themselves? Do they keep 30000 in their bank to uh, keep for taxes? What's kind of your advice on that? So my advice, if you don't have a, an, a CPA to begin with, then I would say you, you kind of know your tax bracket. And if you, you know, by just looking, Googling it, keep that much set aside. If you have no other tax planning done, right? Uh, and especially if now, if you don't even have a, you don't even know if you're going to be an S corporation or not. There's another 15% on top of your ordinary income. So honestly, depending on how much money you're making and uh, in self-employment tax, if you're making 200, 300 thousand dollars between you and your spouse, you're still less than your FICA limit between you know, one of you guys, then you might need to set aside 50%. So that's why it's so important as you start making this money, so important to talk to your, your uh, you know, tax advisor who can run your numbers throughout the year and tell exactly, okay, what's the obligations you can have. But I, would, I suggest if you can figure that out, if you are subject to self-employment tax or not, it can be as high as 50%. Safe, you know, if you're not, just because you do not go bankrupt when you have to pay taxes, I would say at least depending in which state, is out honestly as a flipping business in the, it's taxed at the highest marginal tax rate whichever tax bracket you fall i would save that much yep. now now though if you go to talk to an advisor and they say okay you know what looks like you made three hundred thousand dollars but looks like you're gonna go and buy these rental properties and everything so you're actually not gonna owe anything you're gonna, you're gonna get money back then you don't have to set aside you can yep. i for my clients what i do is rather than setting aside hundred thousand dollars and just anticip anticipating to pay taxes in april I say, take that hundred thousand dollars, go buy a really good cash flowing rental property, and pay zero taxes. Yep. So you know why um, save money for taxes when you can go buy an investment and in, for a long term wealth, not a flip, and then pay zero taxes, right? So again, talk to your advisor. But if you are, if you have no plans to you know go that route just yet, I would say at least save around I don't know, thirty to forty percent, depending mm -hmm. on you know where you. <laughs> Would you fall in your marginal tax bracket? It can be a lot for sure. And that's a good, I like that a lot. Just like set it aside for taxes, but it, while you're doing that, look for some rental properties exactly. so you can use those that set aside money yeah. and 
you're going to pay zero in taxes. Yes, that $150,000 in set aside money is going to be gone, but that's going to be gone in a rental property that's worth $750,000 yeah. if you got a loan on it. Um, and exactly. then that seven fifty is going to be $300,000 of tax write-offs if you can cost seg it. Um, so let's back up a little bit. Like someone's first getting in this business, I'll see. Each, let's uh, just kind of break down what they should be doing. Cause I think sometimes people overthink this whole thing, like in terms of all this, cause a lot of stuff you can backtrack in this business. I, what it said, what you said at the beginning is just keep it simple. Sole member LLC. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what if they're not, what if they have a partner or something, just a normal LLC? Yeah. 50 50. Don't elect an S corporation without talking to your CV. I, I say that because sometimes people will not understand. They will have all these uh, other assets in this, um, in a business. So, even with a partner, get a multi-member LLC. It's you know you have mm -hmm. two member in the LLC. Use that one, and you can always go and retroactively elect an S corporation, even though you're late. It has to be done within three and a half months, uh, but you'll be fine. Your CPA will do some magic to make it retroactively. But it's always a better idea to go and you know, before even getting entity stock string. It, it's always a good idea to talk to your CPA. Yep. I'm I kid you not. I have so many clients who students who actually email me uh, through your group and. They're not my clients. They just say, hey, I liked, uh, you know, Ron said you're great. Can you help me with this? And I have done 10 different entity stock string sessions with them. We don't charge them because, you know, I just like to help those guys out. And they really appreciate that. So, again, reach out to me. I'll help. If anyone needs help, I don't charge you. Okay, I'll just um, give you the entity stock string that you've got to follow. But do not create without understanding it, though. It might hurt you rather than save you money. Yep. Awesome. No, I really appreciate that. Um, I think this episode was uh, long overdue because we've been getting our, our community has been growing. People are making yeah. money. So if you're making money, like figuring out ta as you make more money, like if you're working a job making $60,000 a year, like don't worry about taxes, just make more money, figure out a way to yeah. make more money. That's where a lot of those people came into this community. And now they're making 60,000 W2. They're working 10 hours a week as a land flipper and they're making $200,000 uh, as a land flipper. Um, yeah. But any last uh, pieces of advice, anything like that for anyone in our community? I know uh, this is going to be really valuable for them already, but any last piece mm -hmm. of advice before we end this? Yeah. You know, I have one thing to tell you and you have, we have talked about this and you uh, not just your students, other people have been asking, ask, asking me this, is how to, you know, be in a, they do a lot of joint ventures, like you found a deal in here and there, and uh, they get confused and they will, the sad part is that someone will, someone will just go online and create five different LLCs for each joint venture with the other partner in the group and start flipping a land and make 20 grand and really lose money or filing tax returns. Meaning, do not, create LLCs when you do joint ventures with this, uh, your friends or your, even your mentor and stuff to come up with the arrangement where there's no tax filing obligation for your joint venture. And you know how to do that. I'm sure you, you tell to your students. Yep. Uh, just make sure you, you do a commission based, um, you know, like, like a real estate agent based uh, relationship where even if you, you, can, you can divide the profit, but do not create a joint venture, a JV agreement. Yep. Don't sign anything saying JV agreement, a partnership agreement. It creates a partnership tax filing obligation. And it can, it can start from 2000. It, it just gets very expensive. If you have five, that's 10 thousand dollars. If you have five deals, you yep. lose money. Don't do that. Uh, that's my, uh, I know, departing advice because people will lose a <laughs> lot, lot of money. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ashish, for coming on the episode. Um, again, guys, if you guys have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. Like, subscribe to this episode. If you guys have any other uh, episodes, any other interviewer, any, any other interviewees you want us to have on, please put it in the comments. We'd love to get people on. Um, experts like this in the field, experts that can make you guys more money and save you guys money with taxes, other things like that are amazing. Other than that, guys, have a good day. We'll see you next time. As always, thank you for joining. Please do us a huge favor and like and subscribe our YouTube channel and share this with a friend. It really means the world to Ron and I, but more importantly, it could help change the life of someone else. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next episode.